Greetings and welcome to room 303 in Freshman English. We now turn for a series of comments that will ask us to begin to think about what study in 303 with Freshman English will be like. Now I want to welcome you and I hope that you've already done some work with me online. At LearnStrong.net, there are four introductory lectures to Room 303. My assumption in this series of comments is that you've already watched those four lectures that introduce you to basic learning theory, introduce you to annotative theory, introduce you to master scheduling, and introduce you to some ideas on writing theory as well. But now we're specifically talking about freshman English. And what specifically is it that we will be doing in our time in freshman English? Okay? To remind. We are here to do what? Let's go ahead and begin to take a few notes and let's write this down. Why are we here? I think it's important we ask a question like this before we begin our time together for a year of study of freshman English. And the answer for me will not shock you if you've studied that little poem, My Heart Leaps Up When I Behold a Rainbow in the Sky. I like the idea of understanding learning as fun, although fun is a throwaway word it seems to me, and so we like the word in 303 far better joy. The idea here is that we will engage texts, right, and we will try to derive some sense of joy from the experience of working uh, with these texts. Um, as we engage texts and we draw ideas from those texts, begin to discover, I like that word a lot, so let's write that one down in your notes. Now, why does this matter? I think because the greatest thing in our life is to learn. I mean, think about this, that ability to connect new information to old information in meaningful ways as we've defined it in other lectures. I think it's the thing that you've been doing ever since you were born. And I think it's the thing you do intellectually all your life in the same way that, for example, your heart has been beating all your life, your lungs have been drawing breath, moving in and out all your life. I think that the human mind loves to learn. And so that's our primary project, that connecting of new information, old information. Of course, the question is, let's write it in our notes, how will we learn through these texts? So that will be our first and important question. And the answer is, of course, this won't shock us, multi-level. We're going to have a number of answers to how we're going to learn in 303 as we engage texts. We want to understand, first of all, what we mean by text. And here we're going to use a, a, a word, genre. Okay, what do we mean by this word? Well, we're going to look first of all at texts that are either fiction or nonfiction. Okay, that's a major distinction. Let's write it down. By fiction, we usually mean things that are untrue, and by nonfiction, we usually mean things that are true. But we're going to have a problem right away with this kind of fuzzy distinction. For example, we're going to study texts that are called nonfiction, but when we look at them, we're going to ask the simple question is it possible? that some kind of fictional ideas, untruths, find their way into the text? And the answer is obviously, yeah, it's very possible, especially, for example, if we're doing a narrative that's reflective, looking back on a person's life, maybe an adult writing about what an experience he had when he was 17, and it's very possible that there's going to be some stuff that will, elaborate it, that will be elaborated that maybe aren't completely true, right? Now we're going to read, study, and engage any number of different types of texts. Let's write them down. We're going to talk with poems. We're going to meet stories. We're going to meet essays. We're going to meet plays or dramas. We're going to meet speeches, addresses. Those are important. We're going to meet letters. Those are fascinating. Things that people maybe wrote, they didn't mean to have any kind of audience outside of the person who was writing. We're going to engage journal writing, for example, stuff that was written for nobody other than the person writing. Each of these will have their own special challenges, beginning with language. Okay. Now, when we study a text, we'll always engage the text at our three levels of reading or engagement. Okay. This, of course, is what we call annotation. Let's summarize briefly. Any time we meet a text, we're always asking certain questions. We're going to use a numbering system. That numbering system will actually be on the very paper where you take your annotations. Again, just to remind, there's two kinds of annotations. 
One, internal annotations are notes taken inside of the textbook itself. You will do that at the university level. You do not do that at the high school level in our textbook. Now, of course, we can make copies of pages and hand them to you, and then you can mark them up all you want. But obviously, we do not do this gig in our textbook simply because it costs a lot of money to replace a textbook. So our annotations are not internal annotations, but external annotations. They're taken on another sheet of paper. Down that left-hand side, you're going to do a numbering system of 1, 2A, 2B, 3A, 3B. And you'll just do it down the left-hand side. You're going to skip a few lines so that you have room, obviously, to write some information down. Now, just to remind, our project is simple. You, in an ideal world, you engage the text first on your own. You do your own annotation, and you'll do that with red ink. You're going to divide your page up, and down the left-hand side, you're going to work with your own ideas in red ink, okay? At level one, at level 2A, 2B, 3A, 3B. We'll, we'll summarize those again here in a moment. Then you'll come to class. During class, you'll be taking in class notes with blue or black ink. Again, back to our earlier conversations, you'll be looking for two things. Anything the instructor says you already have written down. That we call match information. And if the textbook says it, you wrote it down, and the instructor says it, the likelihood is really good it's going to be on the examination, right? The second thing you'll be writing down is the new information. The match information, you won't have to write again. You'll just simply, that's why you're working with a different color ink, you'll just simply make those notations in blue or black ink on the left-hand side of the page over top of your red ink. But when the instructor gives new information, stuff that's not in the book, stuff that you didn't discover on your own, that information will go down the right-hand side there, and you'll be giving that information in blue or black ink, okay? Finally, of course, we'll use our annotations for exam prep. Right? Getting ready for our examinations or any kind of projects that might be involved in the assessment process, right? Now, just to remind, level one, level two, level three engagement all ask questions about the text. Those questions are particular and they develop or grow. For example, the first level of reading, level one, simplest question is simply, what does this text say? Now, this is huge, write it down. I am not expecting you to write full sentences as you summarize a text. You use as few words as you need to to summarize what's going on in the text. First this happens, then this happens, then this happens, first this is said, then this is said, then this is said, that kind of thing, all right? At level two, we're going to ask a different question. Not what does the text say, summarizing, but rather what does the text mean? It's here that we begin to look below the epidermal level, the surface level of the text, and we begin to ask questions about, at level 2A, themes, messages. We usually try to represent three, if we can, messages or themes, okay? At 2A, with messages or teams, uh, themes, we're asking, what is this text really trying to suggest to me? Or, as we discuss in class, to us. At level 2B, this is huge, we'll start it. I want you to start even now in your notes. Rhetoric, R-H-E-T-O-R-I-C, rhetoric. Not what is being said, but rather how the author is saying. Okay, not what the author says, but how the author is saying. Now this will be for us huge, and we'll have more to say about this as early as a few seconds from now, all right? Now at level three, our question, if level one is, what does this text say? And at level two, what does this text mean? At level three, we're going to ask an even more important question. Because of our learning theory, and because we define learning as the ability or the capacity, the attempt, to connect new information, to relate new information to old information, at level three, we ask this question, how can I relate to this text in some meaningful way? At level 3A, we'll ask, how can I relate this text to other texts I know. Now here again, just to return, our word text is very inclusive in 303. We give this word precedence uh, for any of the things that we're looking at. Text can mean other things I've read. Text can also mean other things I've been exposed to or seen. Video games are texts. Music, texts. Artwork, texts. So in other words, when we say texts, and we ask about how can we relate this, this text, this idea that we're working with, to other texts, we're speaking in very, very general ways. However, put this in your notes. We always try, if we can, 
to begin by relating to texts we've been studying most recently in 303 in class together, and here's why. Your textbook will be creating units around key central ideas. So in other words, your, your textbook, your anthology creators, have put texts together for reasons. And we're going to try and understand what some of those reasons are at level 3A. At level 3B, this is of course huge for us, really it's the most important level of reading, and we certainly believe that it's going to give us the best ability to remember the text long term. We will ask, how can I relate this text to myself personally? Now this is big. At this point in your annotations, this is the only time that you will be writing full sentences, okay? Everything else is just bullet pointed as quickly as possible. Here at level 3B, you're going to be working, however, with a paragraph of five to seven sentences where you try and connect in some way your own life experiences with the ideas that we've been working with together, okay? Now, for each of these types of texts at 2B, we have special kinds of language. So let's go back to the rhetoric side of things really quickly, all right? Just to review, all right? For example, we have a special kind of language or nomenclature. It's a fun word, nomenclature, special way of talking when we talk about the different kinds of texts that we will be working with, right? Let's just summarize. For example, if we pick up a text called a poem, we're going to look at things like stanzas and lines. We're going to look at things like rhyme and rhythm. Now, obviously, all of this will go into more detail, right? This is the language of poetics, and we want to pay attention to that so that we can begin to have some working familiarity, right? We saw some of this already in an earlier bit of conversation when we talked about words where it's the rainbow, correct? So, for example, when we looked at that poem, we noticed it's divided into certain kinds of line breaks. It has a certain kind of rhythm, right? My heart leaps up when I behold a rainbow in the sky. Ba-bum, ba-bum, that iambic pentameter. All of that is a part of our study of poetics. For stories, for plays, for drama, we're going to have that thing called plot, which is kind of the map of the story, now, of the text of the play. Now we're going to come back to this in more detail, but let's just put it in our notes to summarize. I know you were introduced to, the, uh, to this idea in middle school. Let's summarize. It sometimes is referenced on the whiteboard. You'll maybe remember with a hill that's just defined kind of that way, right? Where you have exposition, the introduction of at least three things. Of course, you've got some sense of time, you've got some sense of setting, you've got some sense of characterization, right? When the text opens, when the play or the story begins, then you have this thing called rising action, which is predominantly understood as the development of some kind of conflict. You'll remember that conflict is defined as primarily two things, internal conflict, character versus self, and then external conflict, and we have three different kinds of external conflict, you'll remember. Character versus another character, we're going to see that, for example, in a classic story called Most Dangerous Game, okay? We can have character against nature. Those are the stories where you have an individual character out, for example, in nature, and nature is doing all kinds of nasties to it and is trying to get away. Finally, you have character versus society, or an idea, and we're going to see all three of these external character conflicts happening as well. Now, of course, let's put it in our notes right away. Classic works, like for example, we'll look at a text like The Cask of Imantelado, okay, Poe's classic text. That's an example of how classic works of fiction can often have more than one conflict, right, that will be played, right? Why is conflict important? Because of the next moment in our little plot hill, namely what's at the top? That we call, of course, the climax, yes? Some of you smiling because this is, of course, stuff you remember from your middle school years. What is climax? Children will define climax as, of course, the most exciting part of the story. We, of course, will not define it that way. We will simply define climax for your notes. We will define climax as the culmination or the fruition of the conflict. That is to say, depending upon which conflict you focus on, you could theoretically have a different climax for you in your study of the text or your viewing of the text. Now with that in mind, the climax then will lead to the falling action on the other side of the hill. The French word is the 
denouement, the tying together, sometimes referred to as the resolution, in old stories or in fables, another kind of text that we can study, sometimes even we will have the moral to the story. That is to say, the stuff I'm supposed to learn from the story, okay, the moral to the story. Now, all of that is, again, assumed when we talk about the special kind of study at 2B of stories, especially of stories and plays. For example, in our freshman year, we will study together Shakespeare's classic Romeo and Juliet, and we'll see the ways in which all of those plot elements are going to be there, okay? In nonfiction essays, write this one down, we have the idea of thesis, that's the central idea, and validation, that's the way that idea is tried to be proved. In, for example, uh, persuasive writing and persuasive essays, we will see this, or even in speeches, for example, if we're, if we're going to take a look at a speech or two. We'll take a look, for example, at Martin Luther King Jr.'s classic, I Have a Dream speech, which is ostensibly a persuasive essay that is, in fact, delivered as a speech. And when we talk about the history of that speech, we're going to point out that actually the speech that Martin Luther King Jr. gave on that important day in American history was not fully the speech that he had written, but rather he became extemporaneous in his presentation. And yet, we will say about that speech at 2B, clearly there's a thesis and clearly there's attempts at validation of a kind. Now we want to turn really quickly to our textbook. In our final moments together, let's just pay attention to the way we will look at our textbook. First of all, I just want to point out that we have some introductory pages where we are going to be given some, some ideas about how our textbook lo looks. Pages 1 up through page 22, I want you to just flip through and I want you to pay attention to the information that's presented there. Anything that's there, I am expecting for you to have already looked at and to have some working familiarity with. There's going to be vocabulary there. There's going to be some ideas that I've already presented about distinctions between fiction and nonfiction and the like. I want you to go through that information on your own. But now what I want to do is I want to pay attention to page 22, 23, and following of your textbook. So please go there with me quickly. For every one of our readings in our textbook, we will always have some preparing work. We will want to pay attention to this. Notice on page 22, before you read, we've got some information there, right? We have on page 23, literary analysis. That is huge. Write this down. Before you do the reading on your own and engage it, and then work with me, possibly online or in class together, I want you to always look at this literary analysis. Whatever is in bold, I want that information written down at 2B right away. That allows you, after your login information, to already be ready to engage the text. Under reading skill, we also will always be doing that at 2B to make sure that we have some sense of what's going on. If there's a chart there at 2B, we always want to make sure that we create that chart as we get ready for the actual reading. Okay? Then look over on page 24. We'll have already this idea of some connections, and more particularly, the big question. We're always going to be looking at this question. This is going to be part of our level 3B work. Also, we'll have vocabulary. Do you see it at the bottom of page 24? That vocabulary words you always will want to be paying attention to, especially if you look at one of those words before you begin the reading and you don't recognize it. If you recognize the word, make sure you look at the definition because sometimes your definition and the book's definition, two different understandings of a word. Of course, as we get into this, then we'll be looking to try and see how those words are used in the reading and obviously the vocabulary words will come up on any kind of an assessment. Look over on page 25. We're going to be introduced always to the author because these texts are created by human beings who lived in a real world and had real life experiences and we want to know who those people are and a little bit about them. Now, some of the people that we will be studying in freshman English we will come back to later in our high school career and study them again. I'm immediately now thinking, for example, of Poe. I mentioned his cask of Amontillado. In our junior year, we'll come back to study Poe again. So we'll learn sometimes a little bit about a writer's biography in our freshman year, and then we'll go on to learn more. Can I make a suggestion? I hope you write it down. You always want to make sure that you read this information, but I also recommend that you go online and do a little bit of research on your own. 
learn a little bit more about who it is that we're reading, and that will enhance your study for the, the reading of the text. By the way, you always want to pay attention to birth date, death date. For example, we'll be looking at Singer and his text, The Wash Woman, but notice that the dates there are provided, 1904 to 1991. In other words, he lives a really long life. Do you see that? Right? Okay. And so that alone, and look at the number of years, he literally lived most of the 20th century. Isn't that fascinating? So that alone is going to inform your study of the text. Go ahead and turn the page. During the study of the text, starting on page 27, you'll notice that the literary analysis information is provided in the far right. The vocabulary is provided. In other words, your textbook is helping you in your study. Look over on page 29. Uh-oh, we have a visual text. Already we're ready at 3A to make some observations, right? We'll have that kind of information. Then I want you to hop over to page 32, 33. After all of the readings in this book, you have some critical thinking guiding questions. We will want you to always do these questions. We will always want you to be paying attention to these questions. Notice on page 33 where they begin. They begin where we will often begin, at level 2B and the rhetorical level. Now, they don't call it rhetorical. They call it literary analysis, but we're going to pay attention to it. And the reading skill information and the vocabulary and word study information at the bottom of page 33, okay? Then if you'll turn the page to 34, it starts all over again with the same project again and again. Now, our final comments will have to do with how we study the table of contents. Let's go to the table of contents now quickly. I want to pay attention now, starting on Roman numeral number 8. So if you'll go there really quickly, Roman numeral V-I-I-I -I -I, in the table of contents, okay? And you'll notice here that we have in your table of contents the entire text of the freshman anthology. Now, you are only working with volume number one. In the second semester, you will work with volume number two. However, your table of contents will give you information for the entire volume one, volume two. Please notice how the units are divided. Notice, first of all, unit one, fiction and nonfiction with a question. Do you see this guiding question? Can truth change? Right? And then notice you've got the...